Well, it's going to be my privilege to um, and, and honor really to introduce uh, our speaker this evening, uh, Marty uh, Rowland. Uh, Marty has been giving um, a series of lectures at the Henry George School uh, that have been very informative on many different subjects. And many of us, I think, have had the opportunity to uh, listen to his talks uh, on various subjects. Just to give you some background about Marty. Um, Marty is a licensed environmental engineer in the states of both Louisiana and New York. He's currently working for the New York City Parks as an environmental engineer, primarily managing closed landfills. Prior work was with Lockheed Marietta in New Orleans and also at the state of Michigan. He has his PhD in urban studies from the University of New Orleans College of Urban and Public Affairs. And he was uh, mentored by Daniel Bromley, uh, a professor emeritus at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He taught courses at the Tulane University on urban infrastructure in 2002. And Marty is excited and has been excited about Georgia's remedy for poverty being land value tax to fund infrastructure. And this was really hit him hard in 2010. Uh, it was a missing link to the infrastructure management, which has been his life. Uh, he's a trustee with the Henry George School of Social Science. He's been an instructor there since 2015. And Marty is also the chair of the Sustainable Asset Management uh, Subcommittee. He's a fellow, a senior fellow with the Asset Leadership Network. Uh, Marty is going to be talking uh, on the commons this evening. I'll let you uh, then introduce us to your topic. Marty, thank you for joining us. Okay, I well, appreciate the uh, the intro, intro uh, Ted. Let me uh, pull my slides up. We're going to welcome uh, questions uh, at the end. I'm going to I'll go through my slides and uh, leave some time for uh, Q and A. But uh, leading off the the slides, uh, the picture that you see is a, a barren urban area, and it's a good way to introduce what the commons, uncommons, and anti-commons are. So, uh, if you can imagine this plot of land being, um, uh, uh, I don't, I don't see any slides. Do you have the share screen on? Oh, oh, okay. Well, good thing that you uh, you mentioned that. Okay, so um, so the the photo that you're seeing on the first slide uh, could be a, a barren plot of land that uh, is being uh, ignored or not being. Uh, it's as if it's open access. So that would relate to uh, the commons, uh, the uncommons being something that's related to. Uh, a catastrophe would be if that land was uh, coated with some kind of radioactive material that would be expensive and very toxic. Anti-commons would be if all that land there was owned by several uh, owners and they couldn't agree on what was going to be placed there. So in a nutshell, that's what those three terms mean. But uh, my subtitle is analysis of mass insanity because I think with those three concepts and the full explanation of uh, how that's been used and how it's being presented uh, gives us some insight in some of the rather crazy things that uh, people do and say and believe. So let me go into the, the next slide and just a quote from uh, Lord Macaulay who said, were great pecuniary interests at stake, acknowledgement of the law of gravitation, even now would be met with opposition. So this uh, rings true with the, the idea of land value taxation. So uh, I'm gonna open this up um, because I, I gave a, a series of lectures uh, last year on uh, called Saints and Demagogues. And in that, uh, course, I was uh, reviewing seven different uh, uh, political scientists or actors. So uh, let me uh, go through this 
what I'm going to call a philosophical space. So what do Thomas Hobbes, John Stuart Mill, and Henry George have in common? Well, their philosophical outlooks define a triangular space that defines differences among all other political economists and a few others. So if you can see the, the six um, uh, topics of my Saints and Demagogues course, you see some familiar names there. Uh, and I put them within this um, triangular space going from the state, uh, the individual, and uh, cooperation, which is Henry George. So uh, I led off with uh, Huey P. Long, governor and senator from um, Louisiana in the 30s. And then um, uh, Thorstein Veblen, uh, representing the that corner of the triangle. And then uh, Friedrich Hayek being the individual angle. So, so if you look at the philosophical space and uh, go in what Hobbes talked about, he said, there's no greatest good, there's only the greatest evil to which society is oriented against the fear of a violent death. So his solution was the state, the rule by a sovereign. Uh, he famously said that in the state of nature, uh, life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, uh, and short. We need the state and it protects us. It could be a democracy or aristocracy, but state monarchy is best. And if you put it in perspective, he wrote this at the end of the English Civil War, which ended in 1651, nine years before Charles II began the restoration. So there's a reason why he had that opinion. So in the current day, you might identify China, Russia, and Iran as countries with Hobbesian absolute sovereigns. Uh, if we go to John Stuart Mill, he's best known for his book on liberty. He valued uh, the individual and believed democracy to be the best form of government and the state actions must have limits, so uh, individual liberty. So today we can point to the U.S. and the West for examples of this form of government. But if you um, look into John Stuart Mill's background, it's ironic that he is held up to a model of ethical behavior, given the fact that he was a colonial administrator of the British East India Company between 20, 1823, 58, before and during the first opium war uh, in China and the second opium war. Uh, an entity that is responsible for 1.8 million uh, deaths in India alone uh, from deprivation and a, uh, a cost of as high as 232 trillion. If you uh, figure that the theft that they identify at 45, 45 trillion was not made. So I've put the, the link down there. So throughout the talk, if you want to relook at some of these slides and copy the slide uh, in your leisure, you can go find those. Uh, then the British Slavery Abolition Act of 1833 provided for the immediate abolition of slavery in most parts of the British Empire, because there wasn't mo any money in it anymore, with the exception of the East India Company. So my question was, liberty anyone? So the idea that John Stuart Mill had was that he believed that um, should focus on the consequences of actions and not on rights or ethical sentiments. And that's uh, a quote from, uh, from that source. So with those two, now we go into Henry George, which is the, the favorite uh, topic of, of my uh, research and presentations. And uh, Henry George believed that uh, uh, men tend to progress just as they come closer together and by cooperation with each other, increase the mental power that may be devoted to improvement. But just as conflict is provoked or association develops any quality of condition and power, this tendency to progression is lessened, checked, and finally reversed. So it's a very delicate balance that Henry George is talking about. But his remedy is the cooperative delivery of common services and goods paid with the wealth from the capture of economic rent, which could in, include land rent and uh, resource rent. 
So today we look to Scandinavia, for example, of Nordic capitalism where common needs are intentionally met with a uh, safety net. So uh, this is what the, the three cornered uh, space I call a philosophical space. If you take this and go to a political policy space, we can uh, use those uh, the same three corners, but we can identify those as the commons, the uncommons, and the anti-commons. And I'm gonna go into a clear definition of what I'm talking about and what the authors that wrote the uh, papers for those, what they meant. So uh, what we'll find is that if you have a response, for example, to the commons, it will be the common good. And we'll get into Eleanor Ostrom's ideas in that uh, little space there, subspace, I suppose. Now, when we talk about the anti-commons, we're talking about gaming the system. And I'll have plenty of examples of that. And then disaster opportunism, which is similar to what uh, uh, another author talked about, but I think the correct word is disaster opportunism. And I'm gonna get in some examples there. So an overview of the, the talk is that uh, I'm gonna instruct and dig deep into the implications of these concepts. Uh, most of them we heard, uh, such as the tragedy of the commons. Fewer people have heard about the tragedy of the uncommons, which was a paper written in 2016, uh, but very few, except for an influential few, uh, people know what the tragedy of the uncommons is. But I think at the end of this class today, you should be able to recognize how a Georgist analysis allows us to dismiss the first, correctly frame the second, and challenge the last one so that its conundrums vanish into thin air. So, uh, so for over a century, a dark force in society has system uh, systematically altered how economics is understood then obscured its role in advancing poverty and inequality for others and gain for itself. I guess the bad news is that the obscuring is continuing, but the good news is that we are on to them. So this is a little bit of my background. I'm not gonna go through this. Uh, Ted did a great job of introducing me. So let's go right into what these three concepts are, uh, commons, uncommons, anti-commons. I like to lead off with Eleanor Ostrom, who, uh, passed away in 2012, Nobel Prize in Economics. Uh, so the paper, Tragedy of the Commons, was written by Garrett Hardin in eight, uh, 1968. Uh, all these papers are available online. Tragedy of the Uncommons by uh, Jonathan Weiner, and then Tragedy of the Anti-Commons by Michael Heller. But it's all around Ostrom's governing the commons from 1990 that allows us to dismiss the first uh, paper, correctly frame the second, and challenge the third. So uh, let's go into tragedy of the commons, which is something that a lot of people know. It's right on the uh, tip of your tongue. But Garrett Hardin was a professor of human ecology, University of California. He warned of the dangers of human population. Uh, now, um, uh, Jonathan Weiner, uh, he talked about the tragedy of the uncommons, and that's about catastrophic uh, and rare events. He's a professor at uh, Duke University Law School. Significantly, he clerked for Stephen Breyer when he was, uh, before he was a Supreme Court justice. And then um, tragedy of the anti-commons, which is something that's less familiar to people. Michael Heller is professor at Columbia University in real estate law, and he was awarded excellence in teaching. So very uh, uh, no notable people writing these uh, papers. Uh, Ostrom identified what was called the common pool, which is similar to what Heller described as group access to differentiate a, a managed commons from one where there are no rules or from neglect uh, called as if no rules. This is what's called open access. So you might uh, see uh, an abandoned factory and you'd say that uh, well, anything can go on there because it's being ignored. But uh, Wiener 
uh, says that the uncommons is a study of the tragedy of neglect, things that are rare and risky events. And I'll be getting to the, the, fr um, the Frisk uh, Bridge in Pittsburgh, which uh, uh, fell down recently. And that'll be an example that I'll be giving in that. So the so finishing out the uh, intro, uh, the best way to see the anti-commons is to see it as the mirror image of the open access commons. Although erroneous explained below, there's resource overuse in the commons, but in the anti-commons, there is an underuse. And this is Heller's idea that's unfamiliar to most people. Underused because there's too many owners. So, so let's um, go into the first uh, point of this triangle, the commons, and we'll go into the response to the commons, which is appropriate, is what's called the common good. So famously, Garrett Hardin coined the phrase tragedy of the commons saying, ruin is the destruction toward which all men rush each pursuing his own best interest in a society that believes in the freedom of the commons and freedom in a commons brings ruin to all. So his solutions were privatizing the commons and state regulation of the commons. And you can see those are two points of that triangle in the philosophical space. So the 1991, however, a year after Ostrom wrote her famous book, he uh, uh, Garden, uh, Hardin uh, acknowledged uh, that the correct analysis of commons uh, would be by the uh, tragedy of the unmanaged commons. So he was acknowledging that Ostrom was correct. He said commons, but what he meant to say was open access resources, some that were unmanaged. So research that was replicated uh, uh, this is the source of my doctoral dissertation in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, so this research that I did replicated what Ostrom demonstrated to be true, uh, but the analysis of Tampa Bay uh, water systems took it further. There's an evolutionary transition within the four property regimes that I'm going to introduce in a second. And there are transition factors involved in each step. So they're not isolated. So uh, Daniel Bromley, my, my mentor, uh, coined the idea of uh, the four property regimes correctly, saying you have open access, private, state, and common pool. He called it uh, common property, but it's the same uh, idea. And importantly, this is the diagram of excludability and exhaustibility. And you can see in terms of excludability, the private and the common pool arrangements are value high. And then exhaustibility of the resources, you've got low values for common pool and public state. So uh, common pool fits in very well in terms of the sustainability of resources. Uh, so there's an evolution in these four property regimes. And let me go into the the factors that were involved. Uh, so if you go from an open access to a private uh, regime, uh, you see population increase, water use increase, impacts to the environment. And I looked at uh, water systems in, uh, in uh, the Bay Area and Boston and a few other areas. And this happens in, in each case. But then when you go from private to state, there's uh, four additional uh, factors which has to do with uh, water rights disputes, understanding the hydrogeology, uh, social and political climate favors change. And then there's always that individual initiative that's taken to uh, create change. And this is the important thing about almost everything that I'm talking about today is that you can't just say, here's the factors, go do it. And everything is fine and dandy that it takes individual initiative and an understanding of what you're doing in order for change to happen. And it just so happens that when you transition from state to common pool, as they did in the Tampa Bay area with their water system, you had the same seven change factors uh, involved. Uh, having a drought in the 1990s kind of helped along that, uh, that transition. 
So if you look at the commons and you look at the response, you can identify Eleanor Ostrom's eight principles of a common pool resource management system as the appropriate response. And if you look at her eight principles, I'll go through each of these because they are important. Uh, a clear definition of the physical boundaries of the resource pool and the membership of the pool, uh, appropriation rights, uh, collective choice arrangements, rights of appropriators to organize institutions. So these aren't people just spouting out what they're doing, they're doing it in, in a collaborative fashion. Uh, monitoring compliance with collective decisions. So there's, there's no game playing, there's no, uh, um, you know, taking, taking advantage of the other person. Uh, the range of sanctions to fit the severity of the violation of the decisions. So you don't want to uh, banish people for, you know, for, for uh, low severity violations. You're trying to get everybody to uh, come back together. Uh, low cost conflict resolution me mechanism. So it, this is the idea that you, you want to succeed as a common pool and keep things together. And then the sets of rules established within a hierarchy of appropriator institutions for resources within larger resource systems and political jurisdictions. So you can have a common pool uh, system within a state that's uh, not within the common pool, but you set your rules so that uh, there's uh, coherency and agreement. But if you wanna read uh, a, a good paper where the, these eight principles were ill applied, there's a, a good reference there. So here's a, an idea. I did a little study on a carbon fuel resource rent um, collected by oil companies recycled to organizations to provide cleaner transit alternatives. That uh, could be a response. I haven't heard of anybody doing that, but it is a, a type of a carbon, uh, carbon tax. Uh, my paper that I, I looked at, I found that a carbon fu a fuel resource rent could be worth as high as 300 billion in the United States based on the price of oil. Uh, recently, we had uh, bridges collapse, uh, uh, works project administration, a WPA for 44,000 bridges in poor condition. That could be an example of a, uh, a common good something that needs to happen so people don't die unnecessarily. Uh, then you have the uh, solution apparently to the affordable housing problem throughout the United States in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They've developed over the last two years what's called a housing zoning overlay system. Then of course, our friend uh, Rick Ryback, he talks about land value return and recycle, which is a type of land value taxation but kind of goes into the, the effect on um, infrastructure um, uh, return. And if you want to find out more about Rick, he's got plenty of uh, materials online. So if you look at the, uh, what I'm calling about the analysis of mass insanity, what we just saw in terms of water policy, uh, there's an analogous uh, uh, analysis uh, idea of, to a political economy. So you look at the four um, types of uh, property re uh, regimes, uh, open access, you can consider that like the Wild West. And most of the, these are as if, you know, Western states have federal grazing land, but uh, a lot of people who raise cattle uh, kind of feel that the that land is uh, open access or common uh, property. Uh, an abandoned inner city, you see a, an abandoned house there, uh, a lot of houses like that in Detroit. And then you could have a toxic waste dump. So those are examples of open access, mostly as if, because somebody owns that, even if it's the, uh, if it's the city or municipality. So then uh, you go into the dominant regime within political economy, and this is the, the state state uh, entity. And you ask the question, when the state fails or the state is captured by private interests, which is not uncommon, the response is 
going to the private, which is uh, an example of stakeholder capitalism, which I'm gonna cover in a second. But this is the, 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 the default. People say the state fails, okay, let's privatize. But if you look at the global financial crisis of 2007, eight, what did the, uh, what did the Fed and the Treasury Department do? They bailed out the banks and the banks bought uh, back their own stock. I call that jaw-dropping chutzpah, where social justice takes leave of its senses because the, the flow of the money should have gone to the homeowners that uh, had just been foreclosed on. They were the ones that were hoodwinked. Uh, it was not the time to give a, a benefit to the people who created the crisis. So uh, talking about the financial crisis of 2007, eight, there are uh, uh, lots of evidence of a historic business cycle being 18 years. So uh, we all should be asking ourselves, what are we gonna do between now and the, the next crisis, which is expected in 2026? So these are some things to think about in the political economy. So going back to Henry George and uh, Elmer Ostrom, there are some good parallels. Uh, and I've got here a chart called the conversion uh, between these two, where she talked about common pool resource management system. Uh, Henry George talked about cooperative capitalism, where Eleanor Ostrom talked about common pool resources. Henry George talked about land value returned. She had eight principles for resource management system and George had a, a logic of natural monopoly. She had sustainable resource use and Henry George talked about human progress. So there's a good parallel between the, the two, just so that this happens that Henry was about a uh, hundred years ahead of uh, Eleanor. So a little bit more on Eleanor. She, she talked about dynamic complexity uh, where the systems that serve the greater whole of the, which they're a part, there's a healthy hierarchy, markets, commons, wholesale, uh, whole households self-organize and they need the state to support that. A common pool resource uh, system um, uh, is a, a regime for organized uh, dynamic complexity. And if you think about uh, fish themselves, uh, what's the equivalent of fish's water to us? Well, they need water and we need air, water, and land. So it puts in perspective that, uh, yeah, air and water are great, but we do need land. And Henry George would uh, underscore that. So uh, there's ethical principles for economists. And uh, I think we can all uh, agree that respect for autonomy in communities is important. We should work with humility and consider other people. Um, so here we, we go into the next paper. We finished the uh, introducing the idea of the commons. So let's go into Jonathan Weiner's uh, uncommons and um, talk about disaster opportunism. So it's a nice sunny day sitting in an airplane. And then we have a attack on the Twin Towers in New York City. So the uncommons involves the misperception and mismanagement of rare catastrophic risks, identification of psychological heuristics and political forces that underlie neglect of these risks. So these are the three things that I'm gonna be covering in uh, several slides here. The unavailability heuristic, the mass numbing and the under deterrence. And unavailability means that it's just not expected or experienced recently. So the unavailability heuristic is that people's concern is heightened when images are available to the mind, uh, unlike on September 11th, where we had these images that were uh, fantastic. Uh, envision and feel importance of an event, usually recent, visible, worrisome for the future, and regulation is crisis driven. Collective political action overcomes interest group opposition and you get things such as the Patriot Act because we're all in it together and we need to 
give up our freedoms for the greater good. Uh, the public is more concerned about unusual dramatic risks, less about familiar routine risks. And this is what uh, Jonathan Weiner is getting at in his paper. Uh, the experts, not so much. There's more concern about accidents with airplanes than automobiles. There's an assumption that the public favors more regulation of uncommon events, but uh, we'll have to question that at this point. So here's the, the first diagram that uh, Wiener has. It's uh, the, uh, uh, the unavailable, uh, unavailability heuristic where he shows this curved line above what the experts might uh, have as a concern. Un, uh, unusual but av available risks. Uh, you know that there's a lot of cracked sidewalks throughout a city. Uh, that's a familiar risk, even though there's a lot of cracks. Um, so another example of this unavailability is the uh, ultra low frequency risks to the picture. Um, not the case that public fa uh, favors more regulation than experts. It's related to the availability of them understanding it. Rare events are not recent, visible, or experienced. This leads to complacency, neglect, and uh, human extinction, climate change, and failed infrastructure are some of the results of this unavailability. So you look at the, the finishing of his little curve where the concern by the average person, the public, dips a little bit uh, where it's very ultra low uh, frequency. And uh, we start off in this analysis with the Pittsburgh Fricks Bridge collapse in 2022. It was January 28th, I believe. But uh, I'm gonna go in a very important um, detour here for about 15 slides, because it's very important to understand who this Henry Clay Frick is. And it has a good lesson here. There was a 60 odd member of the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club uh, leading business tycoons in Western Pennsylvania, included uh, uh, Mr. Frick and his best friend, Andrew Mellon, attorneys Knox and Hayes, uh, Hay Reed, and uh, as well as the uh, Andrew Carnegie. Uh, the club members made inadequate repairs to what was at the time the world's largest earthen dam behind what was formed a private lake called Lake Kanma. Less than 20 miles downstream from the dam sat the city of John, Johnstown. So you had Daniel Morrell concerned about the safety of this dam because he had a uh, iron company down in Johnstown. So he sent his own engineer to inspect the dam, but uh, he died in 1885 and uh, that was, uh, the issue was dropped. The club fatally lowered the dam by more than three feet, poor repairs and maintenance, unusually high snow melt and heavy spring rains combined to cause the dam to give away four years later on May 31st, resulting in the Jonestown, Johnstown flood. Uh, they placed a screen across the spillway, uh, partly blocking the spillway and causing the, uh, the damage. When the word of the dam's failure was telegraphed to Pittsburgh, Frick and the other members of the club gathered to form the Pittsburgh Relief Committee. And, um, what I call the early form of stakeholder capitalism. Uh, maybe that's not clear at this point, but I think it's very important to understand when you have people responding and volunteering for the group that causes accidents, it's, it's similar to stakeholder capitalism. So the club determined never to speak publicly about the club or the flood it must have worked because they named a bridge after him despite the direct involvement in the deaths of thousands of people. And Knox and Reed we offended off all the lawsuits that would have placed blame on the uh, club members. So with a volumetric uh, flow rate of temporarily equaling that of the Mississippi River, the flood killed 2,200 people, caused close to a million, um, close to a half billion dollars uh, in 200, uh, 2015 dollars. 
So the question is, if you've got stooges, who needs terrorists? And this is not all. Uh, what else did uh, Henry Clay Frick do? Well, he was involved in the homestead and labor strike where the Carnegie Steel Plant that he co-owned uh, had 300 Pinkerton detectives assembling five miles below Pittsburgh in uh, July 5th, 1892 to end a labor strike. They were given Winchester rifles placed on barges and towed up river for the object of removing the strikers. Upon their landing, they had a large melee between the workers and the Pinkerton uh, detectives. 10 men were killed, he had 70 injuries. The Pinkerton agents were thrown back. They finally got the 8,000 armed state militia. And during the confrontation, Frick issued an ultimatum to the homestead workers. Um, they refused to speak to him and threatened to have the striking workers evicted from their home. So this is somebody we should celebrate and place a name on a bridge. So let's go back to the to the diagrams now that we've gone over the Frick Bridge uh, detour. The Grenfell Tower disaster. Uh, who, who thought that the flammable rain screens on this tall building in London would catch fire? But they did. People weren't uh, expecting it. Uh, in fact, I don't think it happened before, so nobody was expecting it. Another uh, ultra low event was the Citizen United uh, decision where uh, corporations were determined to be people and money became uh, known as speech. So this upset a lot of uh, uh, campaigns and uh, equity in how uh, elections are held. Also the possibility of a 9-11 attack, you had uh, uh, Muhammad Atta uh, running around the United States doing what he uh, uh, doing what he did with uh, uh, help from a foreign country, but there was very low uh, uh, understanding. Um, the frequency uh, would be low, and there's very little concern. As I said earlier, the initial uh, idea of dying in a plane crash was is more available to people because it's more dra uh, dramatic as opposed to uh, dying from anthrax, for example, or dying in, a plane, uh, dying in a car crash. These are familiar risks, uh, similar to dying from COVID. Uh, people are understanding it now that we've had two years of, of a pandemic. Uh, very importantly, talking about the unavailability heuristic within the uncommons, is that these effects are driven by this interplay of two neural pathways, the amygdala, which is the fear and instant choice or flee or uh, flight idea, or the prefrontal cortex, where you envision hypothetical future scenarios and you've got time to analyze choices. So the former process is faster, generating fear before the latter, has a chance to kick in, which kind of relates to what could be seen as mass insanity, but this is just the way that people are wired. In politics, you have a neglect of short-term costs, leaving long-term benefits hanging. Uh, so let's go into what's called mass numbing. Mass numbing. Uh, this is the uncommons risk, usually have a large magnitude of impact. People are willing to pay more to save a few people, but when you get too many, there's less concern. This explains the neglect of genocide and other mass calamities, including environmental disaster. So when this happens, when you have mass numbing, you have information is overwhelming, we have limited capacity to worry. And then you have another example of mass numbing where you have in the, um, during Katrina, the uh, Richard, uh, the Congressman Richard Baker, a Republican from Baton Rouge said about public housing residents, primarily pri uh, poor African-Americans, we finally cleaned up public housing in New Orleans. We couldn't do it, but God did. And I show a, a image of a book written by a friend of mine, uh, Jay Arena, 
uh, I helped uh, do some of his research in the um, in his uh, dissertation about this uh, same situation. Uh, there's many people that still believe that Katrina disaster in New Orleans was a natural catastrophe. Yet engineering professional analysis says no, it was the improperly designed and installed levees. But uh, don't fear the no public housing structure suffered water damage, yet they tore all the uh, buildings down because they were looking for that opportunity to uh, um, opportunity in a disaster. Even the Army Corps of Engineers talked about the design defects in the levees that caused the damage. So here's the diagram that Jonathan Weiner uh, uh, put together that captures this mass numbing effect very succinctly. And in this diagram, you see the spiking of mass numbing when uh, something happens. And then after it happens a whole bunch of times, then you have mass numbing like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've seen that before. But also in this diagram, you have three other um, um, movements. The first one is a catastrophic premium when even though the effects are uh, few, there's a heightened concern. And then you have the uh, diminishing marginal concern plateau, which I'll give some examples. So in the first uh, example of mass numbing is the Columbine school shooting in 1999, where there's a terrific concern that we need to, we need to regulate guns and take guns from people and such. And then by, uh, uh, since 2013, we've had 94 school shootings per year. So this is the time you just kind of yawn and say, uh, uh, maybe we need to do something, but uh, not today. Uh, you have the George Floyd uh, related riots and property damage. You know, at first they were kind of um, sensational. And then after uh, uh, several weeks and months of the, uh, the riots, they became commonplace. And uh, people were even thinking that it was a good thing to have uh, riots. And then you have the Katrina displaced African-Americans not returning home. Uh, people in the rest of the United States it was just a news story that uh, vanished from the airwaves. And then you have the January 6th insurrection, whereas even though you had uh, one direct death in that event, there's a heightened, uh, what's called a catastrophic premium uh, concern. And then you have what's going on uh, notably now is the expanding NATO to Russia's doorstep. Uh, it's called a catastrophic premium. You might get uh, shooting, uh, but uh, it is the fact that uh, that what, uh, forces in the West have intended to uh, create uh, Ukraine as a, a NATO country, which is something that uh, Putin said was the trigger point. And then you have the example of the diminishing marginal concern which is contracting and dying of AIDS. You can see the di uh, diagram to the left where the incidence of uh, HIV and AIDS uh, dropping off since about uh, uh, the late 90s. So on um, the next, uh, the third term under the um, un uncommons is the under deterrence. Uh, traditional legal mechanisms may have weak or no deterrent effect. Uh, mega catastrophes may be too big to handle. Uh, for example, no government around after the, the disaster. So the question is, why buy insurance if the company is not around to cover the risk? Good question. So this leads to uh, what's called the, uh, the moral hazard. Uh, damages from mega catastrophes may exceed the assets of any defendant. So why should a firm take precautions? Uh, there may be no defendants to sue. The government's immune or, or it's a natural disaster. So public institutions offer ex post disaster relief and bailouts. So why take out insurance if the uh, government's gonna step in? So, uh, so what do you do with uh, addressing the, uh, the uncommons? The challenge for smart government management of uncommons 
is priority setting. Outside of an ongoing crisis, public and, and the experts can each weigh options with their prefrontal cortex unhindered by the amygdala running amok. So you raise revenue wisely, you have equi equitably for the disaster planning, resilient asset design. And I do a little push for the standard that I wrote called the E3210 uh, infrastructure management here, but I'll get into that briefly. But if people have questions, I can get into that. So the in Pittsburgh, the Frick Bridge disaster could be the wake up call needed to address the 44,000 bridges in the US that have a poor condition. Uh, the thing to do is really to shore up all of them so that injuries can be minimized uh, before the next one fails. And if we legislate a, a new WPA to restore the bridges, we can stimulate the economy without causing inflation, uh, providing jobs and uh, protect the public. So in the diagram that I created for the political policy space, the WPA for the 44,000 bridges in poor condition could fit uh, where the uncommons is. Uh, uh, several decades ago, we had regulations for the ozone depleting chemicals, the fluorocarbons, and we, we do have an improvement in the ozone hole because of that. So there are some positive things that we can take advantage of during the disaster opportunity. Uh, you might recall in 2001 too, we had some extreme measures for anthrax where everybody was wrapping their home in, uh, in bubble wrap and, uh, and uh, shrink wrap. Uh, then you have the Patriot Act, a disaster opportunism where we all gave up uh, freedom and liberty uh, because we were under this idea that we were under attack. Uh, defund the police. This is a disaster opportun uh, opportunity to uh, do something that has shown to be uh, uh, ill-advised, especially in New York City. Uh, then you also have disaster opportunities uh, with single issue charities, where you have the uh, idea that uh, po uh, panda bears are going extinct, so you need to do something now and give us some money. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how many uh, panda bears the uh, World Wide Fund for Nature has saved, but that's not the issue you have an opportunity to raise money and that's how you do it. Uh, then you have other charities such as Stand Up to Cancer, uh, ASPCA. Those are part of the uncommons responses. Uh, urban gentrification is kind of interesting. I, I see it as a combination of uncommons and any commons. But if you want to read a very intelligent article about urban gentrification, uh, Strong Towns, has a, a very good treatment of that. Uh, so here we go back to the uh, Pittsburgh Relief Committee. Uh, you volunteer for the group that caused the, the latest disaster. And if you want to volunteer, for example, for Goldman Sachs, you can do that. But uh, it is true that they admitted guilt and paid a uh, $5 billion fine for the involvement in the global financial crisis. So now we come to uh, the last uh, article in this, uh, in this series. Uh, we're going to talk about the anti-commons uh, with Michael Heller. And these are examples, what I call gaming the system. So the best way to see this is to see it as a mirror image of the open access commons. Uh, although erroneous, as explained above, there's resource overuse in the commons but in the anti-commons, there's underuse. Uh, this idea is uh, unfamiliar to most people. Heller says that when privatizing the commons goes too far, you get fragmentation of rights to a resource and thus underuse because nobody can agree on what the use should be. Each can block the other. So surprise, the solution is to have a monopoly to reduce the individual rights. So here we go, Mr. Monopoly, showing where he fits on the political policy space near the anti-commons. Now, Heller had an elegant 
but misleading display of the commons, any commons continuum. And in his uh, paper, he talks about this continuing continuum of open access to the any commons, which he calls full exclusion, and says that uh, there's a zone of cooperative and market-based solutions, which includes an Ostrom type group access and something more like monopoly called uh, group exclusion. But uh, in the middle is what's called private property. And you can see the bias that's being presented here that yeah, we can go to uh, common pool and we can go monopoly, but uh, uh, private property is the way to go. And I've just demonstrated that uh, in nature, Ostrom's ideas have proven out to be uh, effective. But if you look at what um, Heller is talking about, this continuum is really nothing more than the one edge of the political policy space between commons and any commons. So what he doesn't include is the uh, work by Jonathan Weiner on the uncommon. So it, it's a limited analysis, but I do have to give credit to uh, Michael Heller because he came up with the idea of the any commons and if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have been able to do my full analysis here. So Heller's example was that uh, you take the Rhine River under the Holy Roman Empire, the river use and trade was protected. Then in the 13th century, the German barons began collecting tolls. There were up to 200 of these uh, barons. Trade ceased, everybody loses, even the barons. So bringing the concept to today, there's too many owners paralyzing markets. Well-functioning private property is a fragile balance between extremes of underuse and overuse. And if you look at the word overuse, it was coined in the 1600s. So the opposite was ordinary use. It wasn't until the 1960 that the word underuse is used. And you kind of understand um, because of the environmental movement. So instead of ordinary, we are concerned about optimal. In this way, we can discuss sustainable use or use uh, to lessen the effects of climate change. Uh, we are then on a contested path of modern regulation of risk. You know, economic, yes, but also core beliefs. So you could look at the, the positive outcome of the Annie Commons. Uh, you look at New York City's Central Park, way back when the realities of multiple vetoes led to the preservation of this open space rather than development. Uh, then you've got the case of uh, pharmaceuticals. An Alzheimer's drug never comes to market because those holding key patents, property rights, have high prices. So the more patent owners, fewer life-saving innovations. And this situation is called patent anti-commons. So you can see the, the use of that concept. Uh, also in art and music, there's many owners of bits of culture that limit uh, output. Uh, in telecommunications, there's a conflict in electromagnetic spectrum, ownership limits innovation. In real estate, sometimes there's a difficulty of assembling multiple owners uh, can derail important projects, such as the high-speed rail between Los Angeles and San Francisco. Uh, in the oil and gas industry, you have co uh, competing firms fighting over pumping too fast, which is upsetting pressures. Uh, if you extract gas too quick, it traps the oil. Uh, then you have gains in cooperation that are in the billions, if you can just get your act together, yet corporations battle for minute gains. Heller notes that monopoly can keep resources underused, limit innovation, is not always because of too many owners and people who are involved in Henry George know quite well that monopoly can keep resources out of use. So what are the solutions to in the anti commons uh, to overuse and underuse? The state may assert ownership over, for example, lobsters and fish and is issue tradable quotas. Or you can do as uh, Daniel Bromley suggests is that you pay a 
uh, per ton fee caught at the dock. In Australia, you have systems such as these that uh, allow for larger lobsters to be caught rather than having everything be in open access. So in the US, we could take back the electromagnetic spectrum, which is kind of extreme, but uh, that is an option. The underuse of the land can be solved with an appropriate land value tax. Georges would understand this. On all owners paying payable to the group, those providing services that, that make the land valuable, making it costly to keep resources out of use. So you can see that the conundrum that Heller had with the anti-commons uh, really kind of goes away when you talk about a land value tax, because nobody wants to. Um, pay a tax for underused land. So let's look at the, the concept of the so-called 1% and the 99%, something that was popular 11 years ago with Occupy Wall Street. But you can pretty much agree that people in the 1% do earn a lot of unearned income, whether it's from um, uh, real estate speculation or from uh, um, um, from the um, uh, mortgage-backed securities, which kind of led to the collapse in 2007, 2008. So in this diagram, you see the 1% and they have all these arrows coming in. They're getting unearned income from land and resource rent. They probably earn some of their income and they enjoy tax abatements and offshore profits. And then poor people like you and me, we have all these arrows going out we do earn our wages, but we have income tax, we have sales taxes, we pay our rent, we pay our mortgage, and we pay property tax. So this is the situation as it is today. So if we look at equitable taxes, we, uh, we remove that unearned income tax by collecting land value uh, taxes or return and recycle. We allow, un, um, the 1% to get their earned income. And we, uh, uh, we take away the tax abatements and the offshore profits. So then you look at uh, the ordinary people like you and me, we've got arrows coming in and that's good. Wage incomes, we don't pay the income tax. We don't pay sales taxes and there's no building taxes. And then we do have to pay rent and mortgage tax. And one way to get the federal government to kick into the, uh, the idea of no income tax would be to uh, have 100% uh, deductibility from income tax from the state and local taxes, but that's a, another issue. So this is the, the situation that could be equitable. And if we go back to uh, Rick Ryback, we have the unearned income from the rent going to land value return and recycle for those things like high-speed rail or uh, transit options. Then you do have the anti-monopoly laws, but like uh, many lawmakers are in the pocket of monopolists and rentiers, uh, that's uh, what stops that from happening. So that's why fair elections are important. And that's why we have uh, uh, a look at the any commons and we look at what are the responses well, to the responses to the any commons you have could have a market based response, according to what Heller put together on that continuum between any commons and the commons, a market based solution when the nature is not at risk. Uh, when you have stakeholder capitalism, you have that combination of anti commons and uncommons. And you see the picture to the left here where you have the uh, a cartoon with the three corporate executives. So uh, example of stakeholder capitalism with the so-called big reset after the pandemic to going to chop off the head of the monopoly guy, which is just a ruse because we all know what stakeholder capitalism is all about. Uh, we have the uh, New York State 421A affordable housing tax abatement, where you end up with a, a door for rich people, and then you have a, a poor for the 
poor people in the back. And those tax abatements only pay for affordable housing on a temporary basis. And then you have Citizen United, uh, the beneficiaries of that, where corporations are people and money is speech, and you automatically get the protections of the U.S. Constitution because you've manipulated words to that effect. And then if you think about what natural monopoly is, it's really at the exact center of the commons, uncommons, and the anti-commons. So uh, we're getting near the, the end. So at say the clock, I'm going to uh, open it up for questions in probably about 15 minutes. I've got a few slides that kind of adds to the, the material that I just added, uh, that I just finished. Uh, I put together this diagram because it depicts what Henry George talked about in Progress and Poverty, uh, talking about a private economy and a public economy, with the private economy being the goods and services that private companies do, and then the public economy would be the, the, the cities and the natural uh, monopolies, all creating rent and the rent going to pay for those services that make land as valuable as it is. And if you go to the ASTM procedure that I was talking about, I identify an opportunity to slip in land value taxation into that ASTM, sta uh, in the ASTM standard, where in the revenues and outlays diagram, we do have exogenous wealth input from bonds and uh, um, other kind of money coming in from the government. So that's one way to pay for capital improvements in a city, for example. And you could have um, land value taxation, for example, which is E, going to um, pay for uh, relieving some of the debts and for maintenance and operations. Um, but you could have what's called endogenous growth where instead of the exogenous money coming in, you collect enough land value uh, revenue to pay off the capital expenses in addition to the O&M. So uh, that's an example of using that diagram. But I invite anybody who's interested in the, the standard and the group that I'm the chair of, uh, we can create governance models talking about property intangibles and intangibles, I'm not going to go into that. But since we do have a little bit of time, let me spend about 10 minutes uh, going back into history, because we often hear about uh, we had commons before it was enclosed. So let's go into the, the history of the enclosure movement in England and, and put a, a lot of what I just put into perspective in history. Uh, th some things that uh, maybe some of you don't uh, don't remember or were not uh, educated. Uh, Magna Carta, we all heard about it, 1215, uh, unpopular. King John wanted to assuage the rebel barons. The, uh, uh, this Magna Carta was pinned by the Archbishop of Canterbury at 63 clauses. Uh, interestingly, uh, royalty had no universal divine right. That was uh, one of the outcomes. Uh, the forest was dealt with uh, somewhat, but uh, it was effectively an enclosed area. So um, you had a council of barons, Catholic church had uh, uh, sovereignty, but uh, the king didn't abide by it. The barons didn't. Uh, Pope Innocent III annulled it. And it was John's son, Henry III, that uh, redrafted the Magna Carta. And he also penned what's called the Forest Charter for the ordinary people. So he had one for landowners and one for common people. The, uh, notably, the Magna Carta had a, um, a clause about the maintenance of nature and the agricultural land with uh, land revenue. Uh, interesting that women's right to land uh, was number seven, but no royal consent to remarry. Uh, people who lived outside the forest need not appear before the royal justices. Uh, so then we go to the forest charter, which is interesting because the first of 16 clauses protect 
common forest pasture for those accustomed to it, very close to what uh, most of us consider the commons. Uh, clause nine talked about every man to collect wood in the forest as he wishes. And every man may make a mill, fish preserve, pond, marl pit, ditch, or cultivated or cultivate land provided that no injury is thereby given to any neighbor. Uh, and then we get to Henry the Seventh. This is where we go into enclosures in a more dra uh, dramatic fashion. Uh, land was fenced off, and common rights over land were abolished. After enclosure, the owner of that land could do with it as he pleased. Uh, some got into breeding of animals, others uh, into growing crops. And this was the start of a mo more scientific move in agriculture. And this is when England dominates the woolen industry through mercantilist uh, empire overtaking France. So while the enclosure meant that some lost out, others did not, as they started to defend uh, trend to feed what would become a growing population. So the guy that the United States defeated, King George III, his uh, enclosure movement uh, started in the, uh, uh, gained pace in the 18th century. And uh, he had the General Enclosure Act of 1801. Uh, the law no enabled the uh, landowners and the nouveau rich uh, farmers to enclose their land without prior parliamentary act. So this hit the poor hard entitling, um, uh, previously entitled to cultivate land without necessarily opening it, owning it. So the enclosure deprived many peasants of their sole means of subsistence, forced them to seek work in the towns and cities. So uh, some see this as the prerequisite for the industrial revolution. So. Uh, what uh, nature gives, uh, man takes away. But if you think about what I just went over, and this is the, the last slide before we get into the Q&A, that it was up to the common people to institutionalize their commons, something along the lines of Ostrom's eight principles. And if you understand what Ostrom did, she, looked, she went back in time to, uh, uh, to the time of like uh, 1,000 or 1,100, uh, the Swiss uh, pasture lands, they operated according to Ostrom's eight principles. The principles that she discovered were uh, a natural process. So the issue is that the, the common people back in England, they didn't institutionalize their commons. So it was privatized. And I say this is just as when George's failure or fail to capture society's land rent for social purposes. So the moral here is let's not romanticize this failure to act. So just because we might be intellectually powerful in our ideas and uh, ethics and morality, it takes uh, action. So this was the, the last slide. I got eight minutes after eight. Uh, Henry George School of Social Science will always tell you to donate. It's a great idea. It's a good school. We have lots of good educational programs. We want you to join campaigns to advance land value taxation. Ask us if you want to find out more. Fight against rent seeking of all kinds. Um, watch a, a building boom take place when you take the uh, value off of, uh, or take property taxes off of buildings. Uh, in the tax abatements on luxury condos, especially in Manhattan, and give a universal tax abatement to people like yourself. Uh, don't be fooled by a, a soak the rich campaign. Uh, make sure that it's uh, withdrawing opportunity to rent seek, because that's what's important. And that's my uh, LinkedIn uh, uh, um, uh, where you can get a hold of me, uh, Twitter, email, and the phone. So, uh, uh, Ted, uh, I got 10 after 8. I'm open for questions, and I uh, appreciate everybody's uh, patience on all the slides that I presented. 
Uh, we were just going to let everybody, um, we we're just going to make everybody a panelist and then. Uh, sure. Yeah. And, but for some reason it's not behaving. I do see one thing in chat that is the comments. How could common people in the absence of democracy institutionalize the commons or anything else? That's from, uh, I believe, Mark Sullivan. If not, it's from yeah. Asamu Yuihara. So yeah, uh, well, that's uh, that's very difficult to institutionalize something that doesn't exist, and everybody on the opposite side is powerful. Uh, you can <clears throat> you can give that as a, an example of what happened during the American Revolution. Uh, it wasn't a simple thing that they did. If it wasn't for the incompetence of King George III, the uh, magnificence of several military people from uh, Poland and, and France, and the uh, support of foreign governments, which I believe included um, Russia, uh, we may not have had the, the United States as we uh, un understand it. So it is difficult, but I think what Eleanor Ostrom uh, did when she captured what the eight uh, principles of a common pool resource, you can have that as your guidepost. Uh, you might get up to seven, but uh, it's true from her research and the research that I conducted in Tampa that you need all eight and you need people who are cooperative within that system that aren't gonna backbite and, and fight each other. So there's a, there's a, there's a pathway there, but it's not easy. Um, we've tried to upgrade everybody, but it isn't allowing us. <clears throat> so if you want to use the raise hand feature, uh, then we'll let you talk. Talk. You can ask your question directly. I do see one in Q&A right now. How? Uh, okay, never mind. That just says my question is in q &A. Yeah. All right. So, um, Anybody else have questions? We can tell you that the working title of the 2022 CGO conference to be held in Albany, New York, uh, July 15th through 17th is Recovering the Commons. And Marty um, is going to be talking about yeah, was it. Was it uh, Reclaiming the Commons or what? Recovering the Commons. Recover the Commons, okay. Recovering the Commons. So. Okay. Many of the topics that uh, Marty has talked about today will be discussed. You know, we're going to have some um, actual role-playing workshops, etc. So yeah, yeah, it should be fun. Uh, I guess I'm going to be cautioning people to uh, make the distinction between the, the commons and the unmanaged commons and the uh, and the common pool resource system because there, there's got to be a um, you know you can't have free riders in a common pool resource uh, management system. Well, good, I, I was hoping that we'd get a few- uh, yeah. Um, yeah, a question uh, there of the James uh, Fredrickson. Uh, would you like to raise your, uh, your question, please? Um, this isn't as much of a question as it is a, a, a comment, but just to Dr. Uh, Rowland's uh, slide on the fish uh, who needs water uh, compared to the land dwelling, uh, creatures who need water, air, and, and land, uh, recalls a, uh, an example that was cited by uh, the late David Foster Wallace when he uh, delivered the commencement address at, at Kenyon College in 2005. He said there were two young fish swimming out one morning. A much older fish swims toward them in the opposite direction and says, morning, boys, how's the water? But he swims past them so quickly that they can't respond. And after he's passed, one of the younger fish says to the other one, what is water? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, That's I like not that. actually what he said, but uh, you, uh, he, used a, he used the uh, word hell in the, uh, in the, in the response, but. Uh, yeah, well, you know, you could take that same idea and take it to the, the corruption and the um, and the theft of uh, our common resources and say, uh, uh, you know, did you, did you see the, the 
the theft going on and you say, well, no, it's because uh, maybe the media is not advertising yet. You're not a lawyer to recognize it. So there's a lot of different ways to take that, uh, that comment that uh, just because you're in it doesn't mean that you're really understanding it. Yeah, there, there was a quote by Henry George. He, he, I don't think this, I think this was established before him, but he said, we, we cannot know who, who discovered water, but we can be certain it wasn't a fish. <laughs> so. Yeah, um, Sean has a question. Can you please explain your tax theory again? He didn't, he says he doesn't fully understand the image. The, the, the tax theory? Yes, tax theory. Okay, well, um, yeah, I apologize for uh, if you didn't catch that. Uh, what I presented tonight was um, more of a, an advanced Henry George uh, uh, presentation webinar. Uh, I am teaching a, a five week class on uh, the principles of political economy where I get uh, really into the weeds on the, uh, the tax system that Henry George talked about. But uh, just to, to answer your question, uh, the idea behind uh, Henry George's idea is that there's, there's uh, land value, uh, well, locational land value that, uh, that increases continuously as, the, as cities become more and more desirable. You know, like uh, New York City, a lot of people uh, run to the city. We have a few people that left the city and now are regretting it. But there's a lot of advantages of being in New York City, for example. And uh, so the question would be, uh, should a landowner out of right be able to collect what's really socially created wealth in the, the land value? So the Henry George uh, theory and the Henry George system of a single tax would be to collect 100% of that land value and give everybody else a break on income taxes and sales taxes and the, the building value of your, um, of your property. Uh, there'd be uh, more of a revenue neutral for most people. And what you'd be capturing would be the land speculators and other people who are uh, buying condos in, uh, in uh, 200 story um, developments in Manhattan and just parking their money there. Um, you know, there's really not much ethics for us to uh, be allowing uh, wealth to be created that we're not uh, tapping into. I don't know if that uh, answered your question, but it's all about land value, socially created wealth, and how do we pay for those things that make the, the city such a nice place to be, including uh, parks and recreation, which I work for. That happens even in small metropolitan areas. Yeah, um, I live near a community called Fishers and Fishers is a, right outside of uh, Indianapolis. And they are now complaining about um, investor owners doing and buying up single family houses and that 90% of all of their rental property are owned by corporations yeah. and they're not happy at all. They want to actually uh, make a municipal procedures that, that will prohibit that. Yeah, well, you know, the, I don't know how many people know this, but in our, in our uh, annual conference uh, back in January, we had uh, Philip, uh, I think, Condon, and he was uh, from uh, Vancouver talking about the uh, affordable housing overlay that Cambridge, Massachusetts has. And it's really close to the scheme that uh, Walter South had talked about before he passed away, uh, where you uh, allow certain advantages uh, to affordable housing uh, developers that uh, put in 100% affordable units uh, and they give advantages over uh, market rate people or developers. So you allow higher densities and, uh, and you allow uh, 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 trusts and community land trusts so that you don't need to buy the land 
And uh, what you're doing by doing that is just reducing the, the price of land. And that's really the, the Henry George scheme is anything you can do to reduce the, the price of land, you're going in that direction. I recently wrote, uh, recently read a, an article in the New York Times about Spokane. And it's, it, you know, to me, it's, it's sickening to read these articles. And the article had to do with, oh, this guy, this family from Los Angeles went to Spokane thinking that it's going to be a great place to live. And lo and behold, uh, prices are going up and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, like the, the journalists didn't have time to go on, uh, online and, and look for examples of what might work. It was just the same stuff that you were talking about. Is this, um, I think, uh, Dan, uh, you, you asked this question in your seminar once is uh, the real estate industry. Uh, in most industries, they build stuff and make stuff, but the real estate industry, what, what do they produce? They don't, they don't produce land. Yeah. I, I'm not sure if you can hear me now. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. My, I, I kind of get the idea of the, uh, I, I don't know much about the, the George Henry uh, philosophy other than that high level that you just gave, which is what attracted me to the group in the first place. I sort of came to it on my own thinking about a good way to, um, for people to, uh, interact and, and to evolve a society. And that, so that's what drew, drew me here. But you, you put up a, a screen there that was specific, that had some specific like percentages and whatnot. Um, and I was kind of curious how you came up with that. Percentages of uh, what? Uh, it was, uh, well, it was a, it showed, uh, I, I didn't catch it. I kind of came in a little late, but I, I, I it showed, percentages of like inputs and outputs to the comments, like in terms of income. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, that was my, uh, uh, that was my um, uh, just an example. And I, I guess what I was trying to do is uh, have a picture of uh, what we're trying to do when we talk about a single tax. Uh, that diagram had to do with what happens to the people within the 1% of of incomes and people in the 99%. And so pictorially, it's showing that we're trying to get the arrows going out for the 1% uh, uh, and have the arrows coming in representing wealth. So if you were able to capture the, the land rent that's now going to make people fantastically wealthy and you put it toward those things that make uh, society uh, uh, make city, cities a better place to live, which is the virtuous circle of, uh, of, of wealth going to those, those agencies that create parks and police and education and transit, all the things that uh, make uh, for a nice place. So there weren't any percentages in that, that sense. Uh, it's really kind of like a high level example. Okay, I, I thought I saw some percentages in there, um, but but it makes sense on the at the at the high level because I assume the percentage would be a moving target. Yeah, yeah, I think one of the 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 lessons from this, uh, and I and I was really kind of proud of the the uh, the carryover from my saints and demagogues course, which if you haven't seen it, uh, there's uh, six uh, sessions that should be online with the Henry George School. But I identified this, uh, this, um, this philosophical space with, uh, with uh, George and um, Hobbes and, uh, and John Stuart Mill. And then when you look at the, the commons, uncommons and uh, any commons, it's kind of like, like an overlay. It's kind of like a very uh, kind of a nice, uh, uh, conformity to that kind of um, idea and then you get the the response that's appropriate for each of those and so you start to put in perspective using uh, primarily the the wiener paper on the uncommons you know where do we get these ideas for not fixing bridges well it's just disaster opportunity opportunism we uh, we just don't think of things and we just let things go mm -hmm. so, Hopefully, by, by looking at this presentation, maybe 
uh, policymakers will get an idea of things that they shouldn't be ignoring. Yeah, no, I, I think it's good, good stuff. Incidentally, the um, the Frick Bridge is named that because it goes over Frick Park, which is one of three very large parks. One was uh, donated by the Shenley family. This one was donated by Frick, and the other one was Highland Park, which was donated by Andrew Carnegie. Yeah. So, so, so my point was we didn't name a, a bridge after Muhammad Atta, who slammed into the Twin Towers. No. But, uh, he killed about as many people as the Atta did. So, how were large landowners responding to the idea? Well, oh, yeah. the, the bridge goes through the richest ward in the city of Pittsburgh. So I don't know why, you know, somebody said I should do something on the Frick Park Bridge. And I said, well, it's, it's not a land tax issue because they usually, they usually neglect things in the poorest neighborhoods. And this is, this is the richest neighborhood. So it's, it's a very odd situation. Yeah. Yeah. I think with the, the time that between the, it was built and now it, it, it's probably going to take a federal uh, action, but uh, I, I really think that as best as possible, these poor bridges need to be shored up in some way because we know they're going to fall. So um, I don't know. I just hate to be, I'd hate to be that person that inspected that bridge in October and now it fell because his report said, well, it can go for another while. So, you know, what is it that they're inspecting when they they uh, go after these uh, these faulty bridges? I guess it puts a question to what the hell they're looking at. Remember the uh, the Minnesota episode where both I thirty five East and West there was a bridge that fell fifteen years ago, ago uh, and that split. Um, or take the man that Jim Fredrickson and I know about who inspected, yeah. had inspected the tunnels before the great Chicago flood in the, in the 1980s. Uh, yeah. That man, I actually knew who, and he lost his job. He, he was very politically connected, but still he was made, made the scapegoat and uh, he died early because of the stress of what yeah. they had done to him. That's too bad. Yeah, in the uh, Minnesota Bridge, I-35, uh, I think what I read was that they piled too many uh, uh, metal plates in like in one area that kind of changed the, the resonance of that bridge when the, the wind would flow. So I don't know, whatever they, they do, they need to, you know, be careful and have a, a, a cycle where they if a bridge gets to be 25 years old, maybe when it's 20, they start planning to do something different. Or maybe maybe we need to uh, replace the automobile with uh, maybe trains that are more convenient. I don't know. It should be a discussion because we can't just build things and hope they last forever. Um, my brother is a civil engineer and he will tell you in Dallas that many of the bridges uh, are in need of replacement and they're not that old. So if this is an ongoing thing where they have to be inspected. So. Uh, we got Tom Rossman has a oh. hand. Yeah, okay, Tom. I'm gonna make a comment that, that the interesting thing that bridge collapsed in 2007, it was first officially declared structurally insufficient in, in the early 1990s and was again declared structurally insufficient in the early 2000s. So, it was, it pretty much ruined Tim Pawlenty, the governor's uh, chances of running for president. And uh, I think what, what that demonstration is not only that we can't ignore these warnings, it's also the fact that, you know, there, there are consequences. And I think, unfortunately, like with the Pittsburgh Bridge, I don't know if anybody's going to suffer consequences. And luckily, no one died. But um, tying, tying these kind of events to consequences politically for people is essential, I think, to, and, and, and that means raising awareness and, and putting the issue on the, on the table more forcefully. Yeah, I think the, the, uh, the case could lead to a, a positive talking point for Georgia's 
in terms of monetary theory, because there's there's some people that say that if you you um, you put too much money into the economy, you get inflation. But it's not true when you're putting money toward things that need to be fixed, that there's people available to do the things. Because what you're doing, you're just creating a, a larger circular flow of, uh, of wealth. So if you can, uh, if you can finance a, a, a more just circular flow, you can put money in it. You can pay people to fix bridges or do whatever the, the alternative is. Uh, uh, you know, I, I often get questions about uh, Henry George's ideas about uh, uh, about monetary theory, and I think that's one uh, situation where I think Henry George uh, uh, was pretty clear about uh, uh, infrastructure and the and the and the amount of money going toward uh, things that are necessary. Well, it's it's after eight thirty. I got one last question, which is: um, Doesn't the simple accumulation of one issue after another account for the decline of relative attention available to be given to previous problems? Yeah, um, yeah. No, that was a good point. You know, that- yeah, this is something I I I often tell people: Socialists think government can do everything. And, and libertarians think government can do nothing. But the original progressives thought that the fewer things government did, the better it could do them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's truth in that. Yeah, I think the, I really liked uh, Wiener's paper about the unavailability and the mass numbing and the under and deterrence. Um, he did a very good, very good job of explaining why things Uh, could be seen as uh, insane. So I'd like to thank Marty for his really great talk this evening. And we look forward to seeing many of you at our conference uh, on July 15th to the 17th in Albany, New York. Thank you all for coming to tonight's session. Right. If you'd like more information, you can uh, write us on our website. We'll make sure you're on our web, on our email announcements of this and we'll see you you have to name the website so we're not everybody who sees this on youtube knows what it is sorry about that (laughs) it's www.cgocouncil.org yeah and if you want to attend my five-week class on the science of uh, political economy or the principles of political economy i've got class number two tomorrow so just visit the henry george school of social science and uh, sign up Appreciate all the questions. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, and we'll see well, you on the, you. on the 24th of March. Gretchen, watch our website where we'll announce our topic. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks.